Hi, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar titled Knowledge Management for Experimentation Programs. Today, we'll be focusing on how to build continual community knowledge to quantify success. My name is Mike Fradkin. I'll be your host today. Uh, we're excited to be joined today by Insight Lime Analytics founder and principal consultant, Mary Beth Mishkovis. Before we get started, I just want to mention to our audience that this webinar is being recorded and will be made available in the next day or so on our website and YouTube channel. Uh, also, during the webinar, if you have any questions, please feel free to enter them into your question panel, as we will have a brief Q&A at the end of the webinar. With all that said, I'd like to hand it off to Mary Beth. Thanks so much for having me. Um, I'm so excited to be here. Uh, this is a topic near and dear to my heart. Before we get started, um, we will be diving into defining what knowledge management is, but I think this is a really key topic to taking testing programs to the next level. Um, but before I start digging into that, I'll introduce myself a little bit and introduce SiteSpec, um, just in case there's some people who have uh, decided to tune in who aren't familiar with the two companies. Uh, so as, as Mike said, my name is Mary Beth Mushkovis. I'm the founder of a data company uh, that focuses on consulting called Insight Lime. Have a lot of experience working on a data-driven strategy and, and also finding really creative ways to uh, improve revenue for businesses, um, including some, some pretty big ones mentioned uh, here on this slide, uh, and especially looking at testing programs and making them something holistic that's actually a vehicle for improving collaboration across a company, improving test and learn culture as a whole. Um, so really looking at this from a holistic perspective, uh, it's something that I'm really passionate about. Uh, and I'm really glad that uh, that SiteSpec has invited me here today. And um, I'll kick it over to um, Mike really quickly to talk very briefly about SiteSpec and what they do. And um, because we'll be talking a lot about having a platform already and then doing all these things on top of a testing program. So kind of the prerequisite for what we're talking about is to already have a testing program. Great. Thanks very much. I'll make this brief. So SiteSpec is an experimentation first platform, um, as well as organizationally, we, we really subscribe to that as a guiding principle. Um, we've been in that space for over 17 years. Uh, you know, uh, our patent, you know, our platform is patented. It's been used on thousands of digital channels. Um, we've helped optimize hundreds of thousands of user experiences and really on any device imaginable. So, you know, web, mobile, IoT displays, smart TVs, wearables, you name it. Um, you know, I mentioned experimentations at our core. So everything you can do in our platform, we ensure you can test it to assess its impact and value. Um, so as I'm showing here, you have you know, client-side experimentation, server-side experimentation. And so end-to-end -end capabilities, regardless of the elements you want to test, um, numerous options on how you want to test um, various elements. Um, we also have personalization, product recommendations, and analytics. And those are all right, you know, built right in. Um, these are delivered in one unified platform, which is pretty unique. Uh, and this really enables collaboration across, you know, marketing, product, dev, CRO teams that have typically been siloed within, you know, these limited point solutions. Um, so that's just a small bit about SiteSpec. Uh, enough on that. I will get back to the topic that people really joined for today. Um, I thought Mary Beth would be good maybe to start with, you know, what knowledge management is or how we define that. Yeah, definitely. Um, uh, you know, I'll, I'll put this up here, but I'm only going to show it for a second. Um, if anyone actually has heard the term before, um, if you could give me a definition that you think of while we um, actually go into the definition we're going to use. I'm always so curious to see what other people associate this term with. Um, so the way that we're going to define it for today is creating systematic processes for capturing, organizing, and sharing knowledge in a company. Um, the goal is really to store valuable company learn learnings and information in a way that can be easily shared across people. It's really to keep knowledge owned by your company, not by individuals, which is something that happens a lot in companies is that you have a few subject matter experts that get really deep into your tools, uh, developers, uh, anal analysts, etc., um, and that knowledge that they own uh, that really benefits your company isn't necessarily accessible to anybody else. Um, so you really don't want to lose that knowledge when those people uh, maybe potentially go to another company. Um, and then there's a lot of other areas beyond just subject matter expertise where this is super critical. If you find out that there's something that can take your entire website down or really hurt supply chain management or something like that, you want to make sure that you take the learning from whatever that mistake or, or near miss was and 
put that in a place where you can store that knowledge and make sure it's referenced whenever you're going to do a similar project or process again. Um, you don't want to have to repeat mistakes that cost you money, essentially. And in testing, it's really kind of the same thing. Um, but you know, talking about this, this broader ROI of knowledge management, saying it's really important, really important to avoid near misses and mistakes. Um, it's sometimes hard to quantify, but there's some numbers that we were able to find that I think are really interesting. For example, oil and gas companies have claimed to send, save tens of millions of dollars a year on building new wells with better knowledge management. So what I think of there is that they have documented processes on how to best go through that process from start to finish and documentation for all of the different levels of people that would be involved in building a new well. Um, Xerox also said that they save 10% on technician costs per year by documenting things with knowledge management. My favorite example from my very first course in knowledge management in university was about how airlines, this is one of the key ways they make flying so safe is that when there's a near miss in any sort of safety protocol, uh, when they're evaluating the, uh, the safety of a plane before it takes off, et cetera, they have really strict processes on how they capture that information afterwards so that they know what to look for in the future. Um, and then for businesses, immediate solutions really are to keep those technical process knowledge access accessible by multiple people. So if you had one subject matter expert, Dave, who was owning all of your, uh, all of your testing program and all of your analytics implementations, and Dave just knew it all in his head, um, that's not necessarily something that uh, then when, when he's on vacation or something like that, you can easily access and make changes or understand what had been built there and, and, you know, not picking on people with the name Dave specifically. I just picked that one. Uh, also you can improve the speed of processes by documenting details. Um, I'm sure everyone has been in the position where you are doing something that has been done many times for your company and you realize that you're going through similar pain points of, oh, oops, this thing needs to be handed off to this person in this department. And all of a sudden things take a lot longer than they should. Um, another part, which is really relevant to what we talk about today is saving money by avoiding repeated mistakes. If you test something for A-B testing and you test a new feature or a new design change, you, and it really isn't something that resonates with your customers, you want to make sure that you don't test that again or you don't implement that in the future. And now we're going to talk about how to make your testing programs more valuable. Uh, I think a lot of us here are pretty clear about the value of running tests to introduce new features, to optimize the flow of your website. Uh, there's a lot of value in making sure you try it before you do a full implementation. But a lot of times we think about that in a vacuum. We're really just thinking about improving product um, or improving the effectiveness of offers that we're offering on the site, et cetera, um, which is super valuable, but we should be considering what happens to those tests once the win winners are implemented on the site. Uh, so that's something that we're going to dig into right now. And so there's... There's a lot of ways, but I'm going to touch on to four key ways to improve the value of testing programs beyond having a program that's running, making sure that you're putting through big features and, and major marketing changes into that uh, flow. Um, you know, the, the first one is creating an operationalized process for pushing winning tests to production. If you're running a testing program and you're testing new features, but you don't have a clear process that has buy-in across the organization for, hey, feature A won over feature B, can we get feature A pushed into production and at part of our core site in a reasonable time frame in the next few months, et cetera? Um, if you don't have that, you will have a process where you may be finding really good wins and building knowledge about what works for your customers, but that actually isn't actualized into your business. Um, and so that's like a huge pitfall. So you can really improve the value of a testing program by making sure that that process is really seamless. And we'll dig into that a little deeper. Um, we've talked a bit about knowledge management. The way that knowledge management applies to testing programs is creating a knowledge base that can be shared with a wider audience in the company, can be referenced when you're making new decisions about marketing and product. 
Also something that um, maybe you've heard of before if you have a testing program and, and, you know, can sometimes be frustrating because people are always pushing you for the value, but is actually a tangible thing you can give is calculating uplifts of that operationalized revenue. If something that you found can improve the conversion rate by 5% on the site uh, is implemented onto the site, what is the expected uplift in revenue over time? Um, and then also, what's the value of not implementing a loser? If if there was a terrible idea that you tried and it really is going to lose money for the company and now you know not to put that onto the site, that has a huge value that we can quantify. And then the other thing is this whole process, like I said at the very beginning of something I really care about and, and, and think is really valuable for companies is that testing programs can be an awesome way to model data-informed decision-making and bring in a broader audience into testing. Uh, I've seen this before in companies where a testing program starts as something that just brought product, digital product and marketing are using, and it gets other departments interested. It gets brand interested and it gets um, other pieces of the company that can see the value of being able to test out their ideas before committing completely and see how that can really help them get a little bit more customer centric in what they're doing. And this is a super simple visual for something that's not necessarily quite so simple, but I'll touch on some of the pieces and you could kind of take this recording almost and, and use it as a meeting agenda, right? For the, for the start of this, which is um, mapping out where you are at and in this process and where also you might have some gaps of timeframes. So the idea is that you run the test. If there's a winner that's identified, you need to have a process for deciding when those get those features and changes get fit into development life cycles. We have, we'll talk a little bit more about that. It's not necessarily every single winning test too, that needs to immediately go into this. There needs to be a process of deciding strategically, which of these changes make sense for the company. There might be something that one, for example, a really aggressive offer set or something like that, that doesn't line up with the overall strategy of the business. So that might be something that doesn't necessarily go into this, this process of being pushed to production right away, but it still should be evaluated in the same process. Um, and then what happens there is that you need to make sure that you're considering the life cycles of your development team in this. And this is a huge thing that happens within organizations across marketing and digital product and development is that digital product and marketing sometimes don't follow the same project management life cycles as development. So operationalizing a testing program has a lot to do with finding a way to sync up with those things so that you aren't ever a burden or a surprise on development teams and it's something that's just really well integrated. And Talked a little bit about this, but I wanted to give you a super, super bit simple visual on how operationalizing testing increases revenue. So if you have an original test and it gives you this tiny blip of revenue, which is really um, inconsequential in the greater scheme of things, but it's important for you to know, oh, hey, if we add this new feature, it does appear to improve engagement in a way that uh, that will drive more revenue. Then you have this lag time before actual implementation if you decide that that is something that needs to be on the site. And with some companies, if you don't have a clear process for how you operationalize, that can end up being quite a long time, six months, a year, um, sometimes maybe even things that we think would be great for the website and never get implemented. And then once it gets in there, there's uplifted uplift, revenue and um, several of the companies I've worked with have also worked in a decay of saying that it's not necessarily something that creates this you know, it, it, the simple math, like napkin math of like, hey, it improved the conversion rate by 5%. We can assume it'll do that when I put it on the website and it'll do that forever. Isn't necessarily how it works in real life, but it is something that you can start to model out and have understanding and layer this on top of each test that you're implementing and each feature you're implementing to get closer to an idea of a value of the program that you're running. And I touched on this a little bit, but agreeing what gets operationalized isn't as simple as every winning test gets operationalized. Um, there's a lot that goes into determining that as a group, and it is one of those key opportunities to start collaborating more as a company. So there are tests that have come through probably if you're having an active 
program from a lot of different areas. You know, maybe sometimes your senior leadership is suggesting things. The product team themselves is suggesting things. Marketing has things that they want to try. Um, there's a lot of implications before it goes into production. So um, there might be something that warrants a follow-up test if you were doing it only in a specific region. I've, I've worked with some really big brands that have done things like uh, a, brand, a brand rebranding image comparison across several regions. But after the initial test, they might want to verify that a few other ways. They may want to do some um, external con consumer re feedback and research, um, et cetera, because it's a really big investment to go that direction. Um, a test is simply information, directional information that you can choose to use um, as a business user. Um, so there's strategic decisions too about whether a feature that you wanted to test out would require a lot more support from your team longer term. So it could be like, hey, Apple Pay is a great idea because the conversion rate is really high and we're getting new customers in, but it's a huge consideration from a development perspective. So we need to plan that out in advance. And that wasn't part of our pipeline before. So there's a lot of things like that, that I just, I like to call out that this isn't just like super simple and you don't want to just have um, whoever's running the testing program, get that <laughs> final decision-making power, but it is something where you can have a set process where you get together as a group with the stakeholders that do need to be there to make this decision and are able to work through several tests at a time to determine what goes where. And I wanted to give an example of what it kind of looks like to have an operationalized schedule for development. This is something that can apply to a lot of different areas. You could sub in these test operationalization and like analytics and data work with something else, depending on what's the best fit for your company. So for example, if you're a really app heavy company and marketing is something that often needs development work to be, to make changes into your app, that slot could be taken there. But this is a a cycle that I found has been really effective for the companies I've worked with, which is instead of having your marketing timelines dictate what the development team does, you lean into whatever types of type of methodology for project management they have, because typically the way development teams work, they actually have more project management resources than you do as a, as a marketing team. Not always, but it really does often be that way. And they're a lot less agile um, as far as being able to turn around really quickly, change what they're doing. Um, it, ironically, I mean, agile methodologies makes it in some ways that they can do it in blocks, but they're still set into those blocks. So if we think about like a two week sprint, if they have their capacity and you, they know that every few sprints, there's going to be test operationalization stuff that they're going to need to prioritize they're not going to be surprised when you come to them and say, hey, there was a feature that we tested for you and um, ends up it's a great uh, fit and it actually improved um, engagement rates in this certain part of the funnel. Um, we want to implement it. Uh, let's slot it in so that we can have that come into the next few sprints. So uh, pretty straightforward, but it's, it, it's something that um, once you get that buy-in, it's a lot easier to get those pieces done and have everybody be a lot more happy about it and know what's going to happen. Um, and you can cater this to whatever the workload is. If you're really not going to need that block, every single work block that they have, maybe instead you shift that cadence to be like twice a year or something like that, depending on how much volume is coming out of your testing program. Um, so this is a really silly example, um, but we I, I br briefly touched on like how much money are you saving on not implementing losing ideas? So say that you have your CEO come and, and say something about wanting to change the checkout from a three-step process to a 70-step process. Um, I, I doubt that you've had this exact example, but I'm sure that there's been some things where um, someone who's not necessarily super deep into digital product or website and marketing has an idea and it's not necessarily based so much in the data. It's more based in um, whatever their gut feeling is. And this is really traditional kind of thinking when it comes to marketing. And instead of being like, that's a terrible idea. No, I hate that. Wh whatever it is, um, because you have a test and learn culture, you can say, well, we can test it. Um, a lot of times you probably wouldn't have it pass your prioritization process, but maybe this in this specific case it does. Um, and then what you're able to do is turn around and see, hey, that's not a super great idea. 
Um, it actually really decreased our conversion rate. Um, not implementing this idea is going to save us money. Uh, and this is something that we really overlook a lot. The other part of it too, is if you were thinking about changing the features of your site, say a major redesign of a certain section of the funnel, um, adding a new feature for rewards or something like that, and you do a proof of concept implementation, test it with your testing program and realize that it wasn't necessarily going to work for you, that's a lot better than developing the entire feature, implementing it, and then realizing that it's not contributing to revenue or engagement in a meaningful way. So what you can do with these numbers is take that operationalization part of like winning tests implemented and do a simple uh, calculation for the losing features not implemented. And you can get at least a portion of your program value that almost always pays for the tool at least and the program itself. So you're able to say, hey, there's a pretty significant positive return on investment on this program because we've found out a bunch of things that don't work and we didn't do them where otherwise we might've just done them. And we've also found these other things that really work for the company. And um, that gives you at least a portion of the program value. Um, I like to keep it actually pretty simple. Uh, if you're a bigger company and it's more important, you can spend more time on that decay model and things like that for winning tests. But if you're not quite to that level, you can still have this simple calculation so that you're able to just keep track of what you've been doing over time. And then there's some other things you need to think about. Well, you know, there's other things like knowledge retained, growing the culture to be more data informed. They obviously all have a ton of value beyond just this monetary number, um, but sometimes it's good to just be able to show a number as well. All right, and now since we said this is about knowledge management, I'll get back to knowledge management and explain how you need to use knowledge management to get to these pieces that we just talked about for building value. So one thing that um, I, I always talk about this and um, it's really important for quite a few reasons. And I have a little crash course here. You can screenshot this if you want. Um, I also have a link to this calculator that'll come um, with the deck after this presentation. It's free. Uh, we didn't build it. Um, it's just available on the internet, but there's also plenty of other tools that you can use to do this. But um, one thing that also contributes to having a stronger testing program is gonna provide you more value out of that program is pre-testing your tests, which essentially means making sure that whatever you wanna test is actually feasible with the amount of traffic you have and the time periods that you wanna run tests in. So this is one of the reasons why I always avoid saying conversion rate optimization as like the whole program and saying, hey, we're a CRO agency or why? what's our CRO program doing? Because if you take a look at this example, 1.2% for a conversion rate is somewhat standard for a lot of e-commerce businesses. Um, and in this example, I'm taking that 1.2 and saying, I wanna see a 5% uplift. And this website has a million visitors per month. And even with that amount of volume um, for a somewhat reasonable confidence in a test, you're looking at a 24 day runtime for that test. Um, this is the more statistically sound way to run tests. Um, I really recommend that you use something like this. Take that 24 days and that's how long the test runs. You don't look at it before. You don't let it run longer if it wasn't significant. If you hit 24 days, it's not significant. It means there's no difference. So, um, you, know, we'll, you know, we can follow this step by step um, here. But what you would do really is like take every test that comes through as a suggestion Make sure you can identify the, the main metric that you think will be moved by the test. And then you would have your analytics team check to see what the volume would be appropriate. So the further down the funnel you go, um, the, more, the, the less traffic there's going to be. Because in this example, we're assuming that there's going to be a million visitors that hit the checkout page. Um, so that can, that, you know, that really starts to narrow things down. So if you want to run a test on some specific content page, for example, the amount of visitors that you actually get per month are, is going to be lower. Um, so you're really kind of slicing and dicing there. And what you can use that to do is help prioritize tests better. So you can say, Hey, this test actually won't even reach significance in any time period. Can we make it broader? Can we move it to the homepage? Can we test something slightly different? It just really adds a layer of maturity to your testing program. 
All right. And then this is the, 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 the bread, the bread, the meat and the bread and butter of this is that storing knowledge from your tests is something that you absolutely need to do. Um, if you test things and forget it or don't have it stored in a way that can be easily accessed by a large group of people, you haven't saved the knowledge for future testers and, and other people in your company. Um, this is a super simple example. You can make this even out of a spreadsheet if you really um, don't have a lot of resources available to you. Um, but what you want to do is store as much information as possible about the type of test and make it searchable. Um, and so this is just a suggestion. I would probably include a lot of other areas as well um, about uh, what type of test it was, where was it run, um, why, uh, and, and so on. So, and you can even link to, if you do pre-testing and have like a post-test card for it, you would want to link everything in there so that you're able to kind of search through this and be like, okay, we're looking at what we want to do for next quarter. Um, we were told by leadership that it's really important for us to improve um, people adding to cart, how many, te what tests have we already run and what were their results? And you may find something like, okay, well, you know, they were talking about um, the certain idea of changing the way that the product detail page is organized, but I see that we've tested that two times and each time the suggested way didn't work. So if we want to try some other things, we need to try something completely different than this test. So um, the way that you would build out this repository would be to get your subject matter experts in a room and discuss all of the possible things that you would want to search on and you do want to store. And it would it can be something that changes and grows over time as well. Um, I've seen people build out the entire system in a tool like Jira. There's some best of breed tools that do this and have stored uh, knowledge management. Um, and, uh, you know, there's some people who are linking it to Jira tickets, which is also how they're running their program. Um, but it can be as simple as like a Google, uh, sheet or something like that, where you just are linking to whatever your project management tool is, but this database, while it appears really simple is like the crux of everything else that you're doing, uh, when it comes to calculating value, it makes it all so much easier. Yeah, um, and 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 it makes it easier because you need to know which tests um, need to go to development teams. It, this sort of system would be able to keep track for you once they've exited whatever project management tool you're using to run your testing program. What needs to go where? Where losing tests need to be called out so that we don't um, suggest that sort of thing again? What things we really want to discuss with our strategy team for operationalization? And then also those key metrics from each test. So if you have somebody who is going to be calculating those um, uplifts for the program, um, they're really going to need to know this information and aggregating and capturing it in this way makes it so that you can do broader analysis. Really, you're creating additional data and value for your company by building knowledge management. And um, before I end this, I, I think that we're ready to take some questions if there are any. Um, so I'm just going to check the chat or maybe Mike can call them out to me. Yeah, I've been taking my thanks. I appreciate that. That was uh, that was really helpful. It adds a lot of context in terms of, you know, how to apply experimentation. I mean, site spec for us were focused on your platform experimentation and functionality, but, you know, the insights and how you apply them to your organization after that is um, is really important. Uh, we do have a couple of questions here in queue. Uh, one of them here is, do you, do you tie ideation and testing roadmap to the knowledge base? Do you suggest doing that? Yeah, I, I really suggest doing that. I mean, it's another one where it's like, make it appropriate to the, to the size of your business. But I have seen that as a great way to do it because then say you have a card. Um, I keep using Jira as an example, so we'll pick something else, but I guess it's Trello is also owned by Atlassian. But um, so say you're using Trello or something, then you can have that specific card. And even when it's archived, you can have that link to the detailed information. It's another part that we didn't even touch on, but having a template that's required for people to fill out before a test can be evaluated is really valuable. But yeah, having that end to end process is really great because then you have you have all of that knowledge captured in one place. You have like the whole card and everything that happened with it as the test ran and as the, it was developed. And then ideally, you also have some sort of like way that you're sharing the results from those tests. And that would also be linked into the repository. Great. Well, we've got time for a couple more here. Um... At a high level, 
Well, this is what uh, what important data points do you do you like to capture in a knowledge base? Um, so a few of the the key high level ones would be um, the me metric or metrics that were the main things tested on. Um, also the um, the the relative uplift and the the um, the like the testing tolerances that you did use to calculate that. So like the pre and post calculate calculations. Um, you, it's not quite as important, but if you want to, you can also um, capture like the amount of people who saw each variant, um, but really like those uplift numbers there, um, the the revenue generated, if it was a, a revenue specific test or the uplift of like users that moved into the next point of the funnel, whatever that key metric was and how it moved. Another thing that I think is really key is like what it was that you tested. Because the, the example I want to, I always go back to is like, and you hear jokes about it all the time is like button colors or something like that. You would want to have some way to categorize test types that makes it really easy to search so that when, and it wouldn't just be for this example, you could also use it for opposite things like, oh, hey, it's really good idea to test X, but like you could search and be like, okay, we've tested button colors six times in the last three years. And I, you know, can just look in this category, maybe you have a button category or, or something like that. And you can easily say it's never, never really creates an uplift. Let's not test that. Um, and then there's some things that are really specific to your business too. If you have like core priorities for a year or something like that, you want to create almost like a categorization for that as well. <clears throat> if you have some sort of numbering system, my example I had, I had like some a made up numbering system. You want to make sure you're capturing that in the initial test name. Um, the dates it was run. Um, and then I like to have a pretty big description area as well and hopefully make that searchable within your database as well so that um, you can have quite a few sentences saying it was this type of test, we ran it for this reason. Um, and then of course, uh, if you are a bigger company and you wanna do it, linking that back to the, um, to the original project management card and the reports. We have time for probably one, maybe two more. I just wanted to, uh, for, for our audience, we are going to send the slides out um, after uh, after the conclusion of the webinar in case in case any of you were so screenshotting, squinting, and and worried about information you may have missed. Um, so, you know, a couple more here. Um, you know, do you have any tools that you like to use or do you, that your customers use to manage a knowledge base? Question. Um. Yeah. I mean, I there was a few that like when we were setting up this webinar. Um. Uh you mentioned, so I'll pitch that over to you in a second, but um, I, I, I've already kind of mentioned the one that I've seen most, which is that if you're a Jira shop and your broader team has access to it, there's a lot of ways you can customize Jira and Confluence to build out a testing program. And then it links really well into um, your development life cycle. So I do like that. Another tool that our team uses is called Notion. It's very comparable in some ways to what um, Jira can do, but um, it really is a knowledge management tool. Um, and then there's a few that you mentioned. I, we have no affiliation with any of these, but there's a few that are like knowledge management specific tools. Mike, do you remember what all of those ones are called? There's one by Brooks Bell. I think we had discussed yeah. whether or not we, you had used it. Um, there were a couple like I can't recall off the top of my head right now, but we, we were. Yeah, I forget. We, we can send them afterwards if you want. If anyone wants, you can email me, and I can send you the list of all of them. So there's not like you know, I'm not like I always recommend this because it really depends on your business um, and what fits best. I you know, especially if you're already a business that has something that they use for knowledge management, I'm always like right. easiest bear you know access to entry like let's use what we already have if everyone already has access to it um, unless there's some really specific case where bringing in a best of breed tool or something like that is a better option but you're right generally you need to be flexible people have made investments and you just try to leverage what they have um so uh, unfortunately we're sort of reaching our uh, closer stop time i want to be respectful of everyone's time i do apologize again we had some technical difficulties uh, appreciate um, people hanging on and and starting late with us um, I want to, again, thank Mary Beth um, from Insight Lime Analytics um, for sharing, you know, her insights today. Um, I want to thank, you know, our audience members for attending and being patient with us. Uh, for more about SiteSpec or Insight Lime Analytics, we, you know, encourage you to visit our websites. Um, we'd love to talk to you and strategize with you um, on, on how we can, you know, help improve your business outcomes. Um, so with that, I'd just like to thank everyone. Did you have anything additional you want to say, Mary Beth, just in terms of how people can get started with Insight Lime? Um, I no, I, I think... 
I'll just say, you know, we help with this. Um, you know, we're not necessarily affiliate. We partner with some tools and have some good selections, but like really what we can help do is build out these programs if you don't want to do it yourself. But, you know, also hopefully we gave you enough ideas to do it yourself. So that's all. Um, if you want to talk with us or have questions, um, doesn't mean you have to have a consultation. You're always welcome to email us or message me on LinkedIn is a great way to get a hold of me. Um, I'm always happy to talk about knowledge management. I'll talk your ear off about it, but um, I just have this up. So, and, you know, if you don't have a testing tool, um, like I know, uh, Google optimizes sunsetting, um, it's a good time to start looking around and, um, you know, their site spec is one of your options. Great. Well, thanks so much. Hope everyone has a great day. Bye now. Thank you.